Dear listener, The Marvelettes, Stevie Wonder, The Box Tops, Wilco, Elvis, what do they all have in common? Handwritten notes seem to be fading from existence, and we'd like to know your opinion. Do you prefer parchment and quill, envelopes full of sealed thoughts, or do you prefer sending them forth through ones and zeros? Sincerely yours, The Shrinking Violets. Hi, this is April. And this is Lourdes. And we're the Shrinking Violets. And you're listening to Chapter 4. This is where I go to read your letters. So in this episode, we're going to be talking about letters and specifically letters in film and books and notable, notable people in history. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> or just any letters that are interesting. I Okay, I mostly, so in my case, the letters weren't the interesting it's mostly how they, what, what they mean to the story. Well, one of them is what they mean to the story. Another one is what it meant to a person. And another one is just because it's beautiful. So oh, those are my letters. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I did mine, yeah, on just history. There's an author in there, all sorts of um, people. So you want to awesome. go first? Yes, I'll go first. So I couldn't have done this episode without including a letter from Perks of Being a Wallflower, which is an epistolary, 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 yeah, epistolary novel, which basically means it's written in all letters. And um, the novel is, or the book is that Charlie is the main character. He's writing these letters to a person um, who he just calls dear friend. And we can assume that this friend is us, the reader, that mm-hmm. we're the ones entrusted with his letters. And he basically writes these letters as the kind of therapy. He talks about his, um, what is it, sophomore year of high school and what happens through that sophomore year and how he changed through that year. So this is also a movie, if you didn't know. In the movie, Charlie just wants to get through high school In a scene in the movie, I'm not sure if it's in the book because I couldn't find it, but on his first day of school, he's already counting down the days until he graduates. So basically, he just wants to get through. At the beginning of the story, he just wants to get through life. In the story, if you read it, there's an important tunnel scene in which there are, there's like a few tunnel scenes or two, I think. I think the tunnel is a metaphor for how Charlie's character grows from being a person who just wants to get through it to a person willing to participate and take in all of the beautiful parts of life one moment at a time. I'm not going to read the whole letter, but, and I'm going to read two, two parts in two different letters. And the first part shows the tunnel scene and how, how he sees life and he, how he sees at the end of the tunnel is beautiful, but he's not really paying attention at the moment. And then, and then I'll talk about the next one. So um, I'll go ahead and read the first part. And again, I'm not going to read the whole letter, just a part of it. Okay, so he says, there's something about that tunnel that leads to downtown. It's glorious at night, just glorious. You start on one side of the mountain and it's dark and the radio is loud. As you enter the tunnel, the wind gets sucked away and you scramp from the lights overhead. When you adjust the lights, you can see the the other side in the distance, just as the sound of the radio fades to nothing because the waves just can't reach. Then you're in the middle of the tunnel and everything becomes a calm dream. As you see the opening get closer, you just get you just get there fast enough. And finally, just when you think you'll never get there, you see the opening right in front of you. And the radio comes back even louder than you remember it. And the wind is waiting and you fly out of the tunnel into the bridge. And there is the city, a million lights and buildings. And everything seems as exciting as the first time you saw it. It really is a grand entrance. So in that part, He's just thinking about what's on the other side. He's not Uh really taking it in. So in this last part, this is from his last letter to this person he's writing to. And that scene, he goes into the tunnel again, and it's completely different in how he sees life. So let me read that. About half a mile from the tunnel, Sam stopped the car, and I climbed in back. Patrick played the radio really loud so I could hear it. And as we were approaching the tunnel, I listened to the music and thought about all the things that people have said to me over the past year. I thought about Bill telling me I was special and my sister saying she loved me, my mom too, and even my dad and brother when I was in the hospital. I thought about Patrick calling me his friend and I thought about Sam telling me to do things. 
to really be there. And I just thought how great it was to have family and friends and family. As we went into the tunnel, I didn't hold up my arms like I was flying. I just let the wind rush over my face and I started crying and smiling at the same time because I couldn't help feeling just how much I loved my Aunt Helen for buying me two presents and how much I wanted the present I bought my mom for my birthday to be really special and how much I wanted my sister and brother and Simon Patrick and everyone else to be happy. But mostly I was crying because I was suddenly very aware of the fact that it was me standing up in that tunnel with the wind over my face, not caring if I saw downtown, not even thinking about it because I was standing in the tunnel and I was really there. And that was enough to me, that was enough to make me feel infinite. Tomorrow I start my sophomore year of high school and believe it or not, I'm really not that afraid of going. I'm not sure if I will have the time to write any more letters because I might be too busy trying to participate. So if this does end up being my last letter, please believe that things are good with me. And even when they're not, they will be soon enough. And I will believe the same about you. Love always, Charlie. Ah! So <laughs> when I was, because I was doing this last night, I was, re- I, I don't, is the word serendipitous, is it, I think the word is serendipitous, but I was like looking for the right letter in this book. I'm like, yeah, this has to be the right one. Um, <laughs> I knew, I knew I wanted to read the last one and I read it and I'm like, yeah, I'm going to read this one. But then I kept flipping through the book and I found that first part where he talks about the tunnel uh-huh. and I'm like wait a minute this is completely different from yeah. how the last one sounds so then I read the last one again and I actually cried <laughs> yeah I like, like oh I my was, god I was about to cry right now just because I'm yeah. like oh my gosh I love this book so much but yeah. um I just have never thought of it that way I've never compared those two letters and those two scenes yeah. where they're going through the tunnel and I yeah. can see what you're saying now yeah um before it was just kind of like oh yeah we're we're going through this tunnel, like right yeah. away. They he starts yeah. to feel obviously something that there's something special about this moment, but I guess maybe it's not so special for him just yet. Yes, um, right. So I think he's kind of seeing it as in the outside, mm-hmm. um, as opposed to in the last one. He's actually taking it all in, and he's in the yes. moment. And he, I I guess maybe that's how uh, Sam how she experiences it. Right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, good, and okay. And I, I have actually have never seen that in this book until last night, and it just clicked, and I was like, "Oh my god, how yeah. long has it been since I read this book?" And I've never put those those two together. ideas yeah. together. Yeah. <laughs> so that's a good one. I really <laughs> like that one, and it makes yeah. me want to read it again. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> oh God. Okay, so I do want to say that. Also, my list, uh, it, the good thing about the internet is that people already do the job for you, right? They yeah. already research for you. So I yeah. do want to credit uh, where I got these letters um, and it's and the text that I'm going to read before this. Uh, and it's taken from Letters of Note, uh, which is described as an online museum of correspondence, which has been celebrating the humble letter since 2009. And it was founded and is still run by Sean Usher. And you can follow Letters of Note on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. This one I like to call Bertha Brewster was just speaking facts. So he writes, um, it wasn't until the the representation of people act in 1928 that women in the UK were finally given the same voting rights as men. And this is just some background information. Campaigners had been pushing for such a development for decades. However, progress has been far too slow for some. In 1903, a small group of frustrated activists headed by Emmeline Pankhurst broke away from the suffragists and chose to attack the system more aggressively by smashing windows, burning down buildings, chaining themselves to the Buckingham Palace oh. and spending time in prison, all in an effort to be heard. One of these suffragettes, Emily Davidson, was even killed when she stepped in front of King George V's horse at the Epsom Derby. On oh. February 26, 1913, with a protest as forceful as ever, the following letter appeared in the Daily Telegraph, written by a suffragist named Bertha Brewster. Okay, (laughs) here it goes. Yes. Yeah. It says, Sir, everyone seems to agree upon the necessity of putting a stop to the suffrages outrages, but no one seems certain how to do so. 
There are two and only two ways in which this can be done. Both will be effectual. One, kill every woman in the United Kingdom. Two, give women the right to vote. Yours truly, Bertha Brewster. Ooh. <laughs> I thought that was so badass, right? Yeah. That is yeah. so cool. Yeah. So I just, just called it Bertha Brewster was just speaking facts. Bertha Rooster was just speaking facts. I love it. <laughs> I've never even heard of this person. I know, me neither, but I really yeah. like that letter. Yeah, me too. So my next letter is by one of my favorites, Emily Dickinson. Yay! Yay. So I actually, I actually haven't delved too much into her story. And what I know is from mostly from the show. <laughs> But obviously, that's very dramatized. And yeah, it's not, you know, histor- completely historically accurate, because it is a comedy as well. But, but um, one of her letters that I chose was one that she wrote to a an editor, I believe. But anyways, I'm going to start with um, Emily Dickinson is a poet, if you didn't already know it. <laughs> oh, my God, I didn't mean to do that. <laughs> um, she, so she became she actually became famous after her death. Only a fraction of her letters remained since it was the custom to burn a person's correspondence after they died. And Emily had asked her sister Lavinia to do just that. And it was in this request that Lavinia discovered Emily's poems. So her letters are important because Lavinia wouldn't, well, she probably would have found her poems eventually, but that Mm -hmm. is the reason she found her poems. It is because she was going to burn Emily's letters. So there is debate on the genre of Emily's letters. Was she writing prose or poetry? So I thought that was interesting. And now I have to look for, because apparently her letters are published. And I'm like, I need to look for this book of letters. I need to read them. (laughs) One of her most famous letters was to a Mr. Higginson, who she wrote to for almost a quarter of a century She wrote to him for writing advice since he was in publishing and also sent him four of her poems. The letter is as follows. Mr. Higginson, are you too deeply occupied to say if my verse is alive? The mind is so near itself it cannot see distinctly and I have none to ask. Should you think it breathed and had you the leisure to tell me, I should feel quick gratitude. If I make the mistake that you dare to tell me would give me sincere honor towards you. I enclose my name, asking you, if you please, sir, to tell me what is true, that you will not betray me in needless to ask, since honor as it since honor is its own pawn. So I had to actually practice reading that because it was it was too written too like poetically. Yeah. And my favorite part was how she basically what's the word when you make something inanimate sound like it's alive? personification Um, I think yeah I think she personified her poems by saying do you think my verse is alive and should you Uh, think it breathed uh and that to me just ah. when you say that um it was like either prose or poetry um yeah do you know like what the consensus is like I don't I don't know what the consensus is and I would have to read her other letters yeah um because I would but, want to compare, like, why? What yeah, makes yeah. them think? What makes them kind of debate between whether it was one or the other? Like, um, did I she think, switch her styles? You know what I, I mean? Yeah, I think one of the reason is because she uses also she uses a lot of dashes in her letters, oh, unlike okay. a real letter. She, yeah, she uses dashes like if it was a poem. Yeah, um, that's one of the things. And oh yeah, I wanted to say that this letter is important because she was. I think this was the her putting herself out there the first time she's ever putting herself out there and trying to get her poems published, mm-hmm. which she never cared to before that. Um, she was 30 years old at this time. And if you watch the show, this is dramatized in the show. So you get to see that um, oh, okay. journey. Um, but also it's not completely historically accurate, but it is in the show <laughs> and it's fun to watch. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know so. if I got to that part. I know that at some point, I I know I watched the part where she did get something in the newspaper or something oh, yeah. published, and yes. and the, the dad her was dad like, was yeah mad, <laughs> really mad. No, this is in season two. Oh, okay, yeah. All right. So the next one I've called "Boys Like You," Diego Rivera edition. 
Um, and if you don't know what I mean by Boys Like You, it's a Dodie song. And the Dodie song, it's basically about guys that just are not the greatest. They're the yeah. ones that are um, F boys, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so this is the background. It was when she joined the Mexican Communist Party in 1927 that Frida Kahlo first met Diego Rivera, a fellow artist, 21 years Kahlo's senior, uh, who soon became her mentor and husband. Um, Kahlo's uh, life up until then had been a struggle due to polio as a child and a serious traffic accident as a young adult, the latter of which led to problems throughout her adult life. But she pulled through thanks to her love of art. As an adult, she arrived, excuse me, as an adult, she thrived, going on to become one of the world's most admired painters. And Rivera was sim similarly celebrated. Their marriage was famously wild and unpredictable. In 1953, the year before she died, one of her legs was amputated due to gangrene. As she waited for the operation to take place, she wrote Rivera the following letter, Mexico, 1953. My dear Mr. Diego, I'm writing this letter from a hospital room before I am admitted into the operating theater. They want me to hurry, but I am determined to finish writing first, as I don't want to leave anything unfinished, especially now that I know that they, what they are up to. They want to hurt my pride by cutting a leg off. When they told me it would be necessary to amputate, the news didn't affect me the way everybody expected. No, I was already a maimed woman when I lost you. Again, for the umpteenth time, maybe, and still I survived. I am not afraid, I'm not afraid of pain, and you know it. It is almost inherent to my being. Although I confess that I suffered and a great deal when you cheated on me every time you did it, not just with my sister, but with so many other women. How did they let themselves be fooled by you? You believe I was furious about Christina, but today I confess that it wasn't because of her. It was because of me and you. First of all, because of me, since I've never been able to understand what you looked and look for, what they give you that I couldn't. Let's not fool ourselves, Diego. I gave you everything that is humanly possible to offer, and we, and we both know it. But still, how the hell do you manage to seduce so many women when you're such an ugly... The reason why I'm writing is not to accuse you of anything more than we've already accused each other of in this and however many bloody lives. It's because I, I'm having a leg cut off. Damn thing. It got what it wanted in the end. I told you I've counted myself as incomplete for a long time. But, what, but why the f everyone, everybody else needs to know about it too. Now my fragmentation will be obvious for everyone to see, for you to see. That's why I'm telling you before you hear it in, on the grapevine. Forgive me, for, forgive my not going to your house to say this in person. But given the circumstances and my condition, I'm not allowed to leave the room, not even to use the bathroom. It's not my intention to make you or anyone else feel pity. And I don't want you to feel guilty. I'm writing to let you know I'm releasing you. I'm amputating you. Be happy and never seek me again. I don't want to hear from you. I don't want to hear from, I don't want you to hear from me. If there is anything I'd enjoy before I die, it'd be to not have, it'd be not having to see your face wandering around my garden. That is all. And I can now go to be chopped up in peace. Goodbye from somebody who is crazy, crazy and vehemently in love with you, your Frida. <laughs> <laughs> because um first she talks about her leg getting amputated and then she's like I'm gonna amputate you right <laughs> oh my god I'm crying because it's so good it's so good <laughs> it's so good I'm like oh I, I mean I know this is obviously translated but yeah. because we know Spanish yeah I, I now want to read it in Spanish, in Spanish. And like how you know, if that's the same vibe. Yeah. <laughs> um, because it's just like so good the way she made that the whole her whole thing about getting amputated to yeah. their relationship. Like what? Yeah. <laughs> and how she talks about how she's already been through a lot of pain, but this pain was like also yeah. like you, you know, can tell like what an artist she is right yeah from like the way she thinks 
yeah and when i fa- when i saw the movie the freedom movie i and when i learned that diego was the person he was i was so pissed i'm like no that's that's so unfair to fria but you know it's a love hate thing because she created all of this art from yeah. that and her art is amazing if she didn't have all of that pain in her life what would her art be sadly yeah. this is sad to say but yeah Exa- exactly <laughs> yeah to, um, to have that historical letter it adds to her to, art yeah it does mm, and yeah. then like obviously i haven't seen the movie and and to be yeah. honest i don't know much about frida Kahlo. Yeah, um, yeah. so i mean i knew that he wasn't the the greatest i already knew that but yeah. i didn't know the extent of you know why or i didn't know anything about him to be honest yeah. so um just reading this like it gives you it gives me a different understanding of the type of person maybe that she was yeah or the way she thought about things it was a good one. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah my turn the last one is um I, I couldn't find another letter so i remembered that the fourth book in the anne of green gables series was is partly written in Anne's letters to Gilbert. So let me first say that the third book, Anne of the Island, at the end, and if you haven't read the book, well, I mean, it's common knowledge, mm-hmm. I hope, that Anne ends up with Gilbert at the end, finally ends up what? with Gilbert. At, Just, what? <laughs> <laughs> I haven't read it, but I figured. <laughs> yeah. Um, so... <laughs> I think well it's it it, at first they're like they hate each other and that's also common knowledge but at the end she finally gives in in the third book and in the fourth book I expected that relationship to be present in the book but no she has to go off to Wendy Poplar's to to be a teacher and so (laughs) part of the book is her telling her you know, journey in Wendy Poplar's to Gilbert. And I'm like, this is ridiculous. I wanted a relationship, <laughs> but whatever. Anyway, so I wanted to say also, Ellen Montgomery, who wrote the book, um, wrote many letters in her lifetime. And as a child, she had friends who, they would write letters to themselves to be open 10 years later. So I thought that was interesting. And that, mm-hmm. I'm like I want to do that I know and as an adult she also had two pen pals who she wrote extensive letters to um which were actually published and I also want to look for this book of published yeah. letters by Alan Montgomery <laughs> and last I want to say that Anne's letters to Gilbert are important because it is the only time we see first person as opposed to the book being in third person third. Mm-hmm. so that part is interesting. So this is an extract of a letter from Anne to Gilbert about her new temporary home while she's teaching. September 26. Do you know where I go to read your letters? Across the road into the grove. There is a little dell there where the sun dapples the ferns. A brook meanders through it. There is a twisted mossy tree trunk on which I sit in the most delightful row of young sister birches. After this, when I have a dream of a certain kind, a golden green crimson vein dream, a very dream of dreams. I shall please my fancy with the belief that it came from my secret dial of birches and was born of the mystic union between the slenderest, airiest of the sisters and the crooning brook. I love to sit there and listen to the silence of the grove. Have you ever noticed how many different silences there are, Gilbert? The silence of the woods, of the shore, of the meadows, of the night, of the summer afternoon all different because all the undertones that thread them are different. I'm sure if I were totally blind and insensitive to heat and cold, I could easily tell just where I was by the quality of the silence about me. So that's it. I just wanted to that do that because so well it's beautiful. This, yes, it's so beautiful. <laughs> yeah, so I was thinking if if Anne's letters sound like that, how did Ellen Montgomery's letters sound? And yeah, now I have to look exactly. for those. I ah! think even from the beginning, I was like, oh, I was, I'm going to like this. Like, do you know where I go to read your letters? I'm like, oh, yeah! so cute. <laughs> I love Anne. And oh, man, I and think I th- you would like the books. You should read them. <laughs> yeah. And I think, um, I mean, I've not, like I said, I haven't read them, but I think. Yeah. Even from that, it ha- it shows how um, much nature is a part of the story. 
Yes, right? it really is. Oh, yes. The things I like when I think about scenes from having read some of the books, I think of the parts where she described a certain scenery or something like that. I don't really yeah. think of the dialogue. I think uh-huh. of that scene that she talked about or this other scene that she talked about and how it looked. Yeah. So, well, yeah. it sounded really beautiful. <laughs> yes. And now we're moving on to a weird one. <laughs> And this one I titled, I don't know if you're a a genius or just strange, but you're hired. So in 1934, a New York copywriter by the name of Robert Peroche, I don't know how to pronounce that, quit his well-paid job and headed for Hollywood, determined to begin the the career of his dreams as a screenwriter. When he arrived, he gathered the names and addresses of many directors, producers, and studio executives as he could find, and sent them what is surely one of the greatest, most effective cover letters ever to be written. A letter which secured him three interviews, one which led to his job as a junior writer at MGM. Fifteen years later, screenwriter Robert Peroche, um, again, I don't know, won an Academy Award for Best Original Screenplay for his work on the war film Battleground. A few months after, he also won a Golden Globe. So this is his letter that he sent to all those people. Dear sir, I like words. I like fat, buttery words such as ooze, turpitude, gluttonous, toady. I like solemn, angular, creaky words such as straight lace, cantankerous, precunious, valedictory. I like spurious black as white words such as mortician, liquidate, tonsorial, demimond. I like suave B words such as svengali, svelte, bravura, verve. I like crunchy, brittle, crackly words such as splinter, grapple, jostle, crusty. I like sullen, crabbed, scowling words such as skulk, glower, scabby, churl. I like, oh heavens, my gracious, landsake words such as tricksy, tuck, tucker, genteel, horrid. I like elegant, flowery words such as estivate, peregrinate, elysium, halcyon. I like wormy, squirmy, mealy words such as crawl, blubber, squeal, drip. I like sniggly, chuckling words such as cowlick, gurgle, bubble, and burp. I like the word screenwriter better than copywriter, so I decided to quit my job in New York advertising agency and try my luck in Hollywood. But before (laughs) taking the plunge, I went to Europe for a year of study, contemplation, and horsing around. I have just returned, and I still like words. May I have a few with you? Robert Baroche, 385 Madison Avenue, Room 610, New York, El Dorado, 56024. Awesome. <laughs> May I have a few with you? <laughs> oh my God, that's awesome. I know. I was like, wait, where is this going? Where is this going? <laughs> and I'm like, okay. <laughs> it's just like Frida's letter where you start off on one side and then you're, yeah. you're like totally backhand. You know? <laughs> You get whiplash from these letters. <laughs> yeah. Dude, that was awesome. I yeah, like that's that cool. Um, so, so like basically a writing to get a job. Oh, okay. okay. To get it, to land an interview. Like, oh, yes. I, I want to, you know, you might want to hear from me because yes. I, mean, I want a job and stuff. I mean, it's it's smart because it's it takes a lot of guts, right? Yeah. Um, And also because he is a writer, I guess it shows exactly like what type of writing what he, does. he does. Yeah. 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 It's just smart in so many ways. I love it. <laughs> ah! <laughs> so this one, I saved it because I, I think this one was my favorite and it, I titled it mashed potato art and such things. P.S. Delete your art. Okay. Yes. So in 2006, a group of students at Xavier High School in New York City were given an assignment by their English teacher, Miss Lockwood. That was the test to test their persuasive writing skills. They were asked to write to their favorite author and ask him or her to visit the school. It's a measure of his ongoing influence that five of those pupils chose Kurt Vonnegut, the novelist responsible for, amongst other highly respected books, Slaughterhouse-Five. Sadly, however, he never made that trip. Instead, he wrote a wonderful letter. He was the only author to reply, November 5th, 2006. Dear Xavier High School and Miss Lockwood and Ms. 
something Perrin, I don't know, can't pronounce that one, McFeely, Batten, Moore, and Congista. I thank you for your friendly letters. You sure know how to cheer up a really old geezer, in quotations, 84, in his sunset years. I don't make public appearances anymore because I now resemble nothing so much as an iguana. What I, ha what I had to say to you, moreover, would not take long to wit. Practice any art, music, singing, dancing, acting, drawing, painting, sculpting, poetry, fiction, essays, reportage, no matter how well or badly. Not to get money and fame, but to experience becoming, to find out what's inside you to make your soul grow. Seriously, I mean, starting right now, do art and do it for the rest of your lives. Draw a funny or nice picture of Miss Lockwood and give it to her. Dance home after school and sing in the shower and on and on. Make a face in your mashed potatoes. Pretend you're Count Dracula. Here's an assignment for tonight. And I hope Miss Lockwood will flunk you if you don't do it. Write a six line poem about anything, but rhymed. No fair tennis without a net. Make it as good as you possibly can. But don't tell anybody what you're doing. Don't show it or recite it to anybody. Not even your girlfriend or parents or whatever, or Miss Lockwood, okay? Tear it up uh, into teeny weeny pieces and discard them into widely separated trash receptacles. You will find that you have already been gloriously rewarded for your poem. You have experienced becoming, learned a lot more about what's inside you, and you have made your soul grow. God bless you all. Kurt Vonnegut. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> I almost cried reading that. Um. I did cry. <laughs> it's so good. Um, it's so even. good because that is true. Like, um, it's 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 annoying when people when people ask like for advice when the answer is just freaking do it just and do, do it. it all the time. Yeah. But where he went further is is he kind of made an example to do it for yourself to oh. grow inside you. Yeah. And like if you're writing that poem and you know you're not gonna show it to anybody else, you're gonna you're not gonna take any caution with how you write it. You're yeah. just gonna make you know and ah, it's like that. <laughs> like I you feel just like I need to. to I like, know. Paste this on my wall or something. Yeah, just as a reminder, right? Like, yeah. It is about doing it for yourself, and I like that he words as as you have experienced becoming like. Yes. You've already, you've, you've like, just the fact that you created something that wasn't yeah. there before. Right. And you've, you've already gained something from it that you don't need validation from anybody else. Yeah. God, how have I never heard of this letter? And I think this is the universe telling me that I have to read a Karanaga <laughs> book because I have like one or two and I just never, yeah, read I've them. never read any. So <laughs> I'm just yeah. curious as to what his books are like now yeah and the fact that like six kids wrote um students wrote to him and he yeah. was the only one that he was the only author that wrote back wrote back that is uh, respect <laughs> yeah and that's honestly I think that that's a really cool assignment to write it is to an author yeah uh, so that was that so it's time for a fun fact fun fact So since we were doing an episode on letters, I kind of took a deep dive into the U.S. Postal Service mm -hmm. and how it became and things like that. Um, however, that's not really centered around that specifically. Um, I know that, you know, there was a hot topic during Trump admin and the pandemic and voting by mail and everything like that. But there was something, another topic of discussion surrounding the USPS and, and in particular postage stamps. And this happened um, in 2014 and it involved Harry Potter. So this, my fun fact is called, you're a hoe, Harry. So <laughs> I got my information from Washington Post. <laughs> yeah. So there's this guy. And his name is Benjamin F. Baylor. And he served as the United States Postmaster General from February 16th, 1975 to March 15, 1978. Um, I don't know exactly what a Postmaster General is. It sounds kind of made up, like a, <laughs> like a fairy tale kind of. 
postmaster general. <laughs> right? Yeah. Like, hello, I'm the postmaster general. Um, I don't know what it is, but this is what he was. And he was also, not only was he an ex-postmaster general, but also a philatelist. I think that's how you pronounce it. So, philatelist? Yeah. So some etymology behind that is that Phil means love. So kind of like a Francophile, you know, okay. uh, somebody that likes uh, all things French. Yeah. Um, and Greek at Teleia, I don't know how to pronounce that either, meant exemption from payments. So an exemption that was marked by a stamp. So philatelist is literally a person who loves stamps. So he was oh. a stamp collector. Um, anyway, so this guy, he really likes his stamps. Um, and he wrote a nine paragraph letter of resignation to the then uh Postmaster General Patrick Donahue, or um, that the United States Postal Service expressing his how he pissed off he he was. So why was he pissed off? Well, he accused the U.S. Postal Service of prostituting its stamp program. He said that they were putting pop culture icons and images on stamps in hopes of appealing to the public, so so that they can sell more stamps yeah. um, and get more money. And so instead, he wanted to keep honoring like historical and cultural icons um, in the U.S. So, you know, things in history, sciences, sports, and not a boy wizard. He didn't like the idea that they were going to put Harry Potter or that they yeah. had put Harry Potter on a stamp. So he wrote, the stamp program should celebrate the things that are great about the United States and serve as a medium to communicate those things to a worldwide audience. To prostitute that goal in the pursuit of possibly illusory profits does not make sense to me. Yeah. So he, the chairwoman of the stamp committee, because there's the stamp committee that gathered together and they kind of give their thoughts on to what should go on this on the stamps, like the yeah. following stamps that are going to be published. Um, her name is Janet Klug, said that great that he was a great guy and he was an outstanding collector and that he will be missed right and then he's she also noted that he hadn't even attended those meetings in two years so <laughs> he missed how the direction that they were going with this with the new stamps so yeah. including pop cultural icons um and then she she said ben likes history and i like history the postal service is asking us to do more in the way of pop culture we're trying to get a lot of young people interested in stamps. We have to go where they live. Do you have any thoughts on, on that? <laughs> we have to go where they live? Well, first of all, like, I don't think any kids are collecting stamps. <laughs> I don't, I could be wrong. I'm sorry if you're a stamp <laughs> But I don't think it's the thing right now. I don't know. TikTok think, is the thing right now. I think it is. I mean, exactly. If it's not on TikTok, it's not trendy. No, I think it, Um, I, I mean, I've seen, I, when I've bought stamps, I definitely want to find like the cool stamps, like the cute yeah. ones or yeah. Because there are some that are like look so boring, right? There, there are really boring ones. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so I do know that I go towards the ones that are cute and they're pretty, yeah. or it does have some sort of pop cultural icon that I like or am familiar with. Yeah. So yeah. So the Harry Potter stamps that were sold debuted in 2013, and more than 100 million of these stamps have been sold since then. Okay. So. I mean, it did work, but he, yeah. But, he, but yeah, he basically was saying Harry Potter was a tramp, right? Yeah. So this <laughs> leads to my new game, <laughs> to a game that I made. And it, stamp? Just kidding. And it's called Name That Stamp Tramp. It's time to play a game, so why don't you join us? Join us to play a game. The questions will be great, or perhaps a little lame, but that's a it's just a game. So <laughs> the pre <laughs> so the premise of this game is that I will give you kind of a description. Sounds like a riddle, but it's not going to be too hard about icons or people that have been on the stamp since 2013 up to now. I so I have seven here. I did skip 2020 as you should. Just not even going to deal with 2020. Um. And I want you to guess who I'm talking about. 
Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> in so pop you ready? culture? Yes. Well, okay. yeah. Because of tramps. So, yeah. So <laughs> name that Sam Tramp. Okay. The first one. Rich American playboy fights crime with the help of a songbird named supporting character. Batman. Yeah. <laughs> 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 so Batman on October 29, 2014, they celebrated 75 years of Batman depicted from the four eras of comic book history, as well as, as the four incarnations of the bat emblem. <laughs> Number two, adequate anguish. Give this melancholic kid kind hearted child five cents. Uh, what five cents is yeah. so is adequate anguish. He's a child. Yes. He wants five cents. Um, he's adequate. No. So that's the in quotes. In quotes <laughs> is him saying adequate English. Dude, I have <laughs> no clue. Give me another clue. So it is a cartoon. A cartoon. Okay. Comic strip also. Is it Dennis the Menace? Mm-mm. So melancholic, kind hearted child. Can you think of uh, Charlie Brown? Yes. <laughs> the only depressed kid i know <laughs> yeah so um i said adequate anguish as a good grief you know oh, okay. Um, okay so third one uh, military secretary during world war ii by day and female warrior by night don't get all tied up or your secrets will come out wonder woman yes <laughs> <laughs> So Wonder Woman was published 2006, 2016 um, and celebrated her on four new stamps that trace her development throughout the four eras. And then before then, Charlie Brown's came out 2015 and it had 10 still frames of a, a Charlie Brown Christmas. Number four, be prepared. This feline trader is not afraid to throw you off a cliff. Feline trader? <laughs> throw you off a cliff? Be prepared. Feline trader? So is he a feline or is he a trader to felines? <laughs> He's a feline. He, he is one. Okay. So all the cats that I know. The pink panther. <laughs> Name all the cats. Um, Garfield. No. <laughs> a cat woman. <laughs> nope. He's not Grumpy afraid cat. to throw you off a cliff. Who falls off a cliff? <laughs> oh my gosh! Uh, all I know is the 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 the, the uh, road runner and the <laughs> coyote, but that's a coyote. There's a cliff in there. Um, You're gonna be I, like, wow! <laughs> a cat who throws. Oh my god! <laughs> is it Mufasa or the other guy Scar? Scar, yes. <laughs> Oh this God. song is be prepared that is true <laughs> i used to skip over that part so i hate all okay, the villain so songs star um uh from lion king so they did a series of stamps in 2017 that had all these disney villains and that he was part of that number five you ready yes Oh, no, this chap from Liverpool imagines a peaceful world that sadly we might not ever see. John Lennon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so good at this. <laughs> John Lennon. So in 2018, they did a stamp that honors him and is part of the um, because he's part of the Postal Service Music Icon series. I thought that was going to be too easy. Um, <laughs> number six. As a child, I was tickled pink to hear their laughter. How was life in the barrio for this furry red creature that speaks in the third person? Furry red creature? It's not Clifford. Clifford didn't <laughs> live in the barrio. <laughs> furry red creature lives in the barrio. As a child, I was tickled pink to hear their laughter. He lives in the barrio. <laughs> is he a cartoon? Um, not necessarily, but it is a childhood, um, like in a show you would watch as a child. Sesame Street. Uh huh. Elmo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the Barrio. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> he lives in the streets. Um, yeah. So tickled pink is because yeah. tickle me Elmo. <laughs> yeah. And then he also speaks in the third person. 
and therefore that's why I say there um, because you don't you never hear he or she when it's yeah. all. okay cool so that was 2019 honor Sesame Street on its 50th anniversary so then the last uh, stamp tramp ready yes shut down all the garbage mashers on the detention level this mechanical being always saves the day mechanical being <laughs> oh my god this is detention center <laughs> the mechanical being is he a robot yes is it, okay a robot is he a cartoon no <laughs> is he a transformer <laughs> <laughs> wait transformer is a cartoon but no <laughs> <laughs> well <laughs> um it's not it's not think a pokemon of Think of all the robots. All the robots. All the robots. Famous robots. Famous robots. It's not. And always saves the day. Always saves the day? R2-D2? Yes. <laughs> I was just kidding. No, you got it. <laughs> That's just from one of the, the movies. They get stuck in the um, garbage ma- mashers. And uh, Luke is telling, uh, uh, what's say C-3PO to shut, to tell R2-D2 to shut down all the garbage mashers on the detention level. Um, <laughs> and he does. Then that they don't get sm- smashed. Okay. So wow, yeah, those the- clues did not help. That is not <laughs> why I said R2-D2 <laughs> at all. Well, maybe if like if for people that do like yeah. Star Wars, hopefully. They um, would know. <laughs> or, so yeah, that was um, t- 2021. So they did a Star Wars issue. Cool. Um, yeah. So that was the end of my game. That was fun. <laughs> I'm so good at this. And I don't even <laughs> use stamps. I mean, yes, I do. I, I use stamps. <laughs> yeah. Well, I had fun looking these up and coming up with my riddles. So <laughs> those are fun riddles. You should do that more often. <laughs> okay, cool. So that was fun. And we hope you all learned something about all the things we talked about because this was so fun to research too. Last night I was researching and I was just going, getting into wormholes of people that I know, but I didn't know I didn't know a lot of things about them. And now I want to research more and look for these books filled with letters and read the letters. And I just want to keep learning. <laughs> yeah, I think um, I also had a lot. I it was hard for me to choose which ones I wanted to um, to choose for this because a lot of them were so good. Some of them were really long. So I know that it wouldn't really be good to read them on here, yeah. maybe. And then there have been some really weird ones that I've <laughs> stumbled across oh. <laughs> that I don't want to mention on here. Um, there yeah. was another one, by the way. Um, I think it was Mozart. He was just as weird. The thing with his cousin. Oh, I know nothing about something. any of that. Yeah. Oh, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, so there's <laughs> another one that's just very strange. So I think it really, letters really do tell a lot about a person. It's just a very different type of thing. Because I think, uh, to me at least, when you're reading the, uh, like a person's diary, it tells one thing as opposed to how they were, how they communicate, but in a more private way obviously because it's not being recorded around everybody else um, yeah. just in a letter between one person to the other so yeah I just thought it was fascinating to research yeah letters so <laughs> if you're listening this is your message from the universe to look up your favorite people's letters because if you if you're like looking up historical figures that you like more likely than not there are letters that have been uncovered from them it you just have to look for it and yeah. most likely you'll find something and it's just like I think it adds it kind of adds to their art if they are making art or yeah. literature or anything mm-hmm. and it's just a fun it's a fun time <laughs> I think that's yeah I think that's what I have um, learned about that that it does reflect the things that they produce right the things that they yeah. make um, because it's just another thing that they're making right yeah um, I did find one that was like just really short and it was Alfred Hitchcock, Hitchcock, Hitchcock. Yeah, he I guess he got a lot of complaints or he had got an ang- a very angry letter from a father, I believe that his that saying like, oh, my daughter doesn't even want to take a shower anymore because of that shower scene in Psycho. 
and he and he all he wrote back to the to the father was send her to the dry cleaners um <laughs> so, it just, so it was just like whoa <laughs> that's hilarious <laughs> The fact that he even bothered to write back yeah. and wrote back that just snarky reply, like, oh my gosh, it's just so, so like, I just thought when that, when he said that, I was like, oh, that's a clap back, like, yeah. but back in the day, but obviously it takes even more of an effort to write a letter back then, as opposed to, you know, you're it's just at your fingertips. So yeah, I think that I think that'd be it. Obviously, this kind of episode could there could be like a another part to it. But I do yes. recommend that you go and search for letters. <laughs> it's so much fun and it's so niche. But it's I know. Fun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so this concludes our episode. So this concludes our episode about letters, all of the cool letters that we found. And hopefully we make another episode like this because this was a lot of fun. And if you want to leave a comment about which letter was your favorite or if you got any of the answers right to April's riddles, leave a comment. And we'll see you next time for our next episode, which we still don't know what exactly that will be. But yeah. I guess I guess it'll be a surprise for all of us. <laughs> see ya. See ya. Bye. Bye. Pa, espérame. Estoy haciendo algo.